From 2011 to 2018, he saw patients in the McDougal programs in Santa Rosa. He is a board member of nutritionfacts.org and a representative and speaker for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, also known as PCRM. And he is a co-founder and emeritus chief medical officer of Switch Healthcare Incorporated. He is certified in leading and managing statistical process improvement and is an expert in preventing and reversing chronic diseases. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Don Forrester. Uh, Dr. Forrester, is there anything you would like to add before we jump into things? No, that pretty well covered everything. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, first first thing I want to jump into is can you explain the connection between animal farming and the link to viruses like COVID-19? Sure. Uh, COVID-19 is a novel virus, which is a combination of a coronavirus and another animal, uh, a virus that came from an animal. Uh, we think that originally coronaviruses came from bats in the wild and the other coronaviruses that have since come into human uh, contact are SARS in 2002 uh, and MERS, which was in 2012. And all these coronaviruses seem to have come through live markets, uh, which are around the world. But in this case, from China, uh, the 2002 uh, coronavirus uh, SARS uh, came through from bats to civet cats, pom mm. the palm civet to uh, humans. And then the uh, 2012 came from bats to camels to humans in the Middle East. And the more recent one looks like it may have come from bats through pangolins in Wuhan, China, live, live market there to humans and then spread. Uh, what makes these things particularly problematic isn't the fact that it's a coronavirus because coronaviruses make up about 30% of the common cold along with rhinoviruses and adenoviruses. It's the fact that it has a novel uh, animal protein attached to it from an animal that makes it something that humans haven't seen before. So there's no immunity. So the connection is uh, for the coronaviruses is through the live markets and the transport, exotic transport of live of the animals to those live markets. Okay, and, and what is the connection between the mistreatment of animals in COVID-19? Well, you know, all these live markets are, you know, based on mistreating animals. Uh, they tra they're transported to the mar markets in very poor conditions. Uh, they're kept in small cages in close contact and unsanitary conditions. They're often killed in the live markets right there and uh, or given to people to take home to kill in their homes. Uh, so there is a lot of mistreatment. The other pandemics we've been exposed to, uh, such as the influenza pandemics, the bird flus have come through the concentrated animal feed operations, which don't seem to be as much of an issue with the coronaviruses, but they do for the influenza viruses, uh, which can potentially be much greater threat to us. Uh, okay. The mortality rate is much higher. So yeah. all you know, the live trade, the uh, live markets, the exotic trade, and also the concentrated animal feed operations all involve mistreatment of animals on a very large scale. Yeah. You touched on it briefly, but have any other pandemics been traced back directly to animal populations? Excuse me, Kelsey? Yeah, just about all the pandemics have, uh, with possible yeah. exceptions of you know, some of the, the Hong Kong and Asian flu in the uh, 1950s and 1960s, we're not exactly sure the genesis of those. Uh, the first pandemic we really know about that really killed lots, millions and millions of people was the 1918 uh, avian flu outbreak, uh, which uh, killed anywhere from 50 to 100 million people in this country and spread around the world over a two-year period. Uh, yeah. So, and it looks like at this point that there may have even been uh, some cases before 1918 and 1917, uh, and they've, they've traced the virus back now, interestingly enough, to possibly uh, a horse in Toronto, where it made the first leap a number of years earlier and then worked its way over 
to Europe where World War I was going on, and that's where it seemed to have really taken off. So we've been, uh, you know, the pandemics were around 1918, a couple flu pandemics in the mid 20th century. But for the last 50 years, we have seen these novel sort of viruses coming out on a regular basis, uh, about once a year, actually. The fact that they haven't spread to be a pandemic within humans uh, is just luck, basically, on our part. Uh, people are aware of things like AIDS, which is another sort of factor where people are eating bush meat, um, and that killed 25 or 50 million people. But of course, uh, AIDS and Ebola, which is another one, uh, are transmitted by body fluids, and they're not as they're a little easier to contain. They don't. They can be difficult to contain, but they're a little easier to contain than pandemics that are associated with respiratory transit, transmission between okay. humans, because those are very difficult to contain. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of pandemics that... Oh, go ahead, Stevie. Would you mind turning your camera on? Uh, I tried to do that, but uh, it's blocked by the host. I think you have to enable it, Stevie. Um, okay, I'll look into that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so a lot of pandemics have been traced back to animal populations. Um, have any other pandemics been traced back to industrialized animal farming? Well, the, the ones that have been, the, the scariest one was the bird flu, which started about a little over after 2000. and it. It originated in the concentrated animal feed operations in China. And the crazy thing about, or the really worrisome thing about the bird flu that had everybody worried was about one in two people who got it died. So even though there were only 400 cases, 200 of them died. So it was a very high mortality rate. Just to put that into perspective, the annual flu epidemics that <clears throat> we deal with every year uh, turned to be about less than 1% uh, death rate. So you can imagine what a 50% death rate can be. So that was sort of the first one that really caught everybody's attention. SARS caught everybody's attention in 2002. That was sort of the first one. And it was, uh, the, 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 way, the reason we were able to contain SARS, which is a coronavirus, uh, was that people were actually sick before they were infectious. In other words, people would run a fever for a day or two uh, and feel really badly, but they weren't infectious yet. So people can't, you know, so if we, if we took, if we found people who had fevers and quarantined them and kept them away from other people, you can stop the illness. At that particular time in 2002, uh, all people who were being flown around the world uh, were being checked for temperature. And if they had a temperature, they weren't allowed to fly. So we were able to contain SARS, but with the current SARS uh, virus, uh, you are infectious before you're sick. So you're infectious even before you know you're gonna get sick. And it seems like there's a lot of people, about 20% of people actually catch it and don't have any symptoms at all, but are able to transmit it. So there's mm. a lot of unknowns about this virus. Uh, we're just still figuring it out. Yeah. Um, are there any other viruses that humans have suffered from due to animal abuse that you haven't covered yet? Well, there's a whole class that we haven't talked about, uh, which are the foodborne illnesses, uh, like pathogenic E. coli. Uh, those people get on a regular basis, like salmonella from eggs, uh, MRSA, which is not MERS, but MRSA, which is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, which tends to come from large pig, concentrated pig operations. Those are things that have been around now for a number of years and that we've dealt with clinically uh, in medicine uh, have changed types of antibiotics we've used because of them. And they're directly linked to animal agriculture in this country. Uh, the uh, 2009 swine flu outbreak which the first recorded case was actually a five-year-old child in Mexico outside a concentrated pig operation in Mexico, which was actually a Smithfield Farms uh, 
operation that had been moved from Virginia because the uh, pollution from concentrated animal feed operations is so large, it was messing up a river. And it, because of the uh, Clean Water Act, they decided to move the whole plant to Mexico. Mm-hmm. So that's the other. So we have found that the concentrated animal feed operations are able to give us both uh, swine influenza and bird influenzas, whereas the coronaviruses seem to be coming through the exotic animal trade in meat markets. Okay. How many people would you say approximately have died in the past 100 years due to these viruses? Well, since the 1918 flu took out 50 to 100 million people at just at the start, uh, plus what we're experiencing now and everything in between, I would think it would be well over 100 million people uh, mm-hmm. and probably a lot higher than that, actually. Because a lot of times people die and we don't know. Uh, you know, in medicine, we don't do a lot of autopsies. And uh, a lot of the people that are dying from these pandemics die from pneumonia which is a typical cause of death. And we often don't even know what type of pneumonias there are. So, um, Yeah. It's a lot, even yeah. considering not knowing the unknown. And not only that, but I think the worst thing is that uh, with things like bird flu and uh, MERS, which had a 30%, which is a coronavirus that I mentioned that comes through camels, it has a 30% mortality rate, which means about one out of three people died. The only thing that has kept us from experiencing those pandemics um, are the fact that they're not very infectious yet. <clears throat> they haven't made the leap. You know, they're, they're seriously, and they cause a lot of death when we do get infected, but it's very difficult for us to get infected. Uh, this current pandemic uh, is one that it's very easy to get infected, evidently. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, how does a pathogen then develop in an animal population and then spread to humans? Well, there are natural reservoirs in animal populations. Let's take bats, for instance, which is a natural reservoir for uh, coronaviruses. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they, they roost in very large populations, so they're in close contact. And then when they go out at night echolocating and eating bugs, every time they echolocate, they throw out respiratory secretions. So they're sort of set up for coronaviruses as a pool And the coronavirus and the influenza viruses have a very high mutation rate, which allows them to change rapidly uh, and incorporate other types of uh, proteins into their makeup. So you've got these natural reservoirs out there. Now, humans really didn't, uh, didn't deal with much of these sort of infectious diseases from animals uh, before about 10 or 15,000 years ago. About 10,000 years ago, when we domesticated uh, animals, uh, we got a lot of the common illnesses that people know about, like measles and chickenpox and smallpox. All those came to us through different animals that had been domesticated. Uh, But those illnesses we've dealt with through the years, uh, when I was growing up um, back in the Middle Ages, we didn't have a lot of vaccines. So uh, I suffered measles and chickenpox and rubella things that our children now do not suffer because we have vaccines. The reason we have vaccines for those particular viruses uh, is that they don't mutate. They're pretty constant. So once something is stable, you can develop a vaccine. The problem with influenza vaccines and corona vaccines, and we've never really developed a corona vaccine yet to fight the common cold successfully, is the organism changes so much by the time you get the vaccine out it's not effective anymore. Which is scary. Yes, it is. Uh, And, you know, we're we're pretty good at making influenza viruses, but the, I mean, influenza vaccines. Uh Uh-huh. But but it's it's a guessing game. They look around the world and they sample what influenza strains are out there. And then based on what they think is going to come next year, they develop a strain that has three or four different, viruses you know covered and if they guessed right then we have an effective vaccine and if they don't guess right the vaccine is not that effective yeah it's possible even if they've guessed right that the back that the virus has mutated and changed in the interim anyway because it takes about a year or 18 months to develop and test a vaccine and get it out 
which is a long time. Right, it is. And, and we may learn from the current one and be able to speed that up a little bit. But I, at this particular point, based on our track record, I wouldn't bet that we're going to have a coronavirus vaccine, period. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's talked about. It would be nice, and I would welcome one that is, that is effective and safe, but I'm not going to hold my breath because I don't think one's going to be developed. Let me yeah. We're, we're going to have to find another way um, to prevent oh. things like this. Right, and the way to prevent things like this, of course, is no more animal, live animal trades, no more live markets, no more yeah. trades, no more concentrated animal feed operations. Now, you know, we often point to other countries as being the problem, but we do have those in our current country. Uh, we do have live markets in California, New York. There's legislation being written right now to actually make those illegal. Mm-hmm. Cory Booker has introduced a Senate bill to solely phase out and ban concentrated animal feed operations, which we have a lot of in this country. <clears throat> so, yeah. you know, we, I think we can do things within this country to help minimize the f likelihood that we're going to cause one of these pandemics, uh, but we don't have as much control over other countries. And since, sure. and since if other countries don't change, we're going to be at risk, and I think that puts individuals uh, on the hook to either uh, be prepared for social distancing like we're experiencing now, or if something like bird flu were to get going up with a 50% mortality rate, the, the government would actually quarantine you in your house. In other words, it would be, you would not be able to go out for food or anything, and the uh, essential workers would be told not to go to work. Um, including doctors, uh, because they have 50% chance of dying. Uh, so, you know, I think individuals, the best thing they can do is sort of have supplies on hand in advance to prevent the next one coming if it does come. Uh, and I'm sure there will be another pandemic. It's just a question of time. But then again, yeah. we've known this for a long time. And the United States, as opposed to the governments of Hong Kong, Korea, and New Zealand, did not act fast enough and appropriate enough in planning and preparation for this. And we still do not have adequate testing in this country for some reason, uh, and whereas other countries do. So there, there's a lot to be learned from this pandemic, but I think individuals shouldn't rely on the government or, you know, they can protect themselves individually and be prepared to be at home for up to 90 days. They can also uh, support legislation like Cory Booker's and the, the legislation that's going to come out in California and New York to ban live markets and, and exotic pet trade. Um, yeah. So that's what we can do as individuals, I think. Certainly. And, and to go back a little bit, what are some of the similarities between wet markets, say, in China compared to live markets in the U.S.? Well, I'm not very familiar with live markets in the U.S. I've just looked at the videos and, and some of the pictures from the live markets in China. But my sense is they have a much wider range of animals over there. And their culture is such uh, that they put a premium both on fresh meat and they use products from these animals in traditional medicines as well. Uh, uh, and, uh, and other products. I mean, th these cute little uh, mask civet cats that sort of gave us SARS in 2002, they put them in cages and feed them coffee beans, and the coffee beans pass through the civets, and then they take them out of their feces and they turn them into a coffee, the world's most expensive coffee. So, I mean, there's just different cultures and and different things going on. So my sense is we have live markets in this country, but they don't have the range of the animals they do overseas. And they're not quite as uh, large in their scope. Uh, the one in Wuhan, evidently the live market in Wuhan, not only is one of the largest live markets in China, but it's also uh, a very large fish market as well. So th th they do a lot more of it over there than we do here. Of course, they have a lot more people too, but. What are the similarities?
similarities then between say a wet market and an industrialized animal farm here, um, specifically the conditions that the animals are living in? Well, I think it's just a matter of degree. On uh, the live markets are keeping animals in small cages and horrific conditions, but the concentrated animal feed operations are, you're talking thousands of animals. Uh, sometimes for the chicken, the poultry houses uh, 20 or 30,000 animals uh, in those. And they're in particularly tight quarters and unsanitary conditions. And it's just a formula for a brewing ground for, you know, pandemics, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. What, what changes do people need to make in order to put an end to pandemics like COVID-19? Well, it's up, I think it, the biggest, if you really wanted to end them, if, if they could ban concentrated animal feed operations, live markets, exotic pet trade around the whole world, that would end the pandemics we're seeing now. That doesn't mean there won't be other ones, but uh, it would certainly eliminate what we're seeing now. Uh, but since that's somewhat of a push, I think uh, what people can do individually is just eat a lot less meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. Uh, although we haven't seen pandemics from fish yet, they are doing uh, a lot of fish farming, which has a lot of the same problems that the concentrated animal feed operations do. Uh, uh, the influenza virus uh, was originally a duck virus uh, that crossed over to, you know, to, to uh, actual chickens and then became a respiratory. It was originally a, a, a waterborne virus that then transmitted to chickens that became a viral a respiratory virus. So we're based on genetics, we're understanding a lot more about this, but from an individual standpoint, I would say just prepare for the next one, as well as stop eating dairy, eggs, and farm, and farm type stuff. But I, I, I would say even beyond that, support efforts to ban those practices in this country would be important. Because I think once we've banned it in our country, we're in a better position to recommend other countries do that as well. Yeah. That's, I mean, yes, TV. Kelsey. That's okay. Would you mind trying your camera one more time for me? Sure. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay. I'm going to try to make you the host and see if that works. Ooh. I don't know. It sounds like an upgrade to me. I'm a little bit worried about that, but. Do uh, you mind trying again? Okay. It says I'm the host now. There he is. There Hi, are. Dr. Forrester. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for being with us, everyone. Okay, please continue. What's the name of the cow that I'm sharing the, menu, the field with? That's Panda Bob. Oh, very cute. <laughs> oh, it's good to, yeah. good to see yeah. your face. Um, so just to recap a little, People could help make a change by cutting animal products out of Absolutely. their diet. People seem to be under the myth that they need protein from animals for some strange reason. And having been around John McDougal for a number of years, I'm thoroughly convinced based on the literature that there's never been a protein deficiency reported in the history of the human race with adequate calories. And even the, the IRA prisoners who fasted themselves to death after they just did water fasting for 80 days and they started dying. They, when they did autopsies on those uh, IRA prisoners, they had plenty of protein on their body. They just didn't have any fat. Their brains had shrunk down and their immune systems were, were weakened to the point that they died of pneumonias. So you don't need animal protein. As a matter of fact, from an environmental perspective, it requires a lot more energy to make a gram of animal protein than it does to make a gram of plant protein. So, Yeah. So eat plant protein, I'm hearing you say. <laughs> well, the, the best diet, I mean, it's, the people ask me that question all the time, you know, is how should I eat? I said, well, the best, I don't even know what a whole food plant-based diet is because I, I bump into people who say, oh, I'm, a, I'm whole food plant-based and I eat fish. Uh, so just whole plant foods and minimizing processing with salt, oil, and sugar. So, you know, the bottom line is uh, if you eat things that don't have labels, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, they haven't started labeling tomatoes, you know, in the produce departments yet. Uh, uh, beans don't come with labels on them. Uh, you know, there are canned beans where you have uh, 
salt added and, and things like that. But uh, you can get beans that don't have anything added and soak them yeah. up. And use them. So uh, I think probably uh, going to a whole plant diet, minimizing processing, so you're minimizing uh, salt, oil, and uh, sugar. Uh, but you got to remember also when they process foods, they take out fiber, which is also very healthy for you as well. Yeah. So if we stopped eating and abusing animals, would that put a halt to viruses like COVID-19, MERS, Ebola? Around the world? We could go around the world? Yes. yes. If, if, the, if everybody in the world did that, we would avoid it. If everybody in this country did it, we would prevent it from happening in this country, but we might still have to deal with things coming in from China if they didn't do it. Of course, or other countries. Right. Um, there is a large use of antibiotics on farms in the United States. Is, is this creating an antibiotic-resistant bacteria? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and we, you know, I dealt with this for years as a practicing clinician with the Kaiser Permanente Medical Care Program. Uh, the 80% of the antibiotics or so that are used in this country are used in concentrated animal feed operations. And some of the organisms like MRSA and pathogenic E. coli uh, have been bred through those concentrated animal feed operations and actually kill, you know, you have about a one in five, 50,000 chance of dying from one of those foodborne illnesses every year. You have about mm -hmm. a one or chance of catching one. I used to see a lot of people that would have the 24-hour flu, you know, this intestinal upset, and a lot of times that was just from uh, contaminations in animal foods. Uh, mm. So if you don't eat them, uh, you can't get them. Uh, eggs are the most common cause of foodborne illnesses. That's salmonella. Uh, the uh, staph aureus, which is resistant, is probably a lot of that's due to uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, so it's making our job tougher in the hospitals because of the use of antibiotics in concentrated animal feed operations. And there have been some efforts to try and control that, uh, but they haven't been very successful, unfortunately, at this point. Yeah, I'd imagine that is scary as a healthcare professional. Yes. And so yeah. Especially when the infectious disease people okay. come and yell at you not to prescribe over prescribe antibiotics when most of the over prescribing is done outside the medical industry. It's actually done in animal agriculture. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, those are the questions I wanted to run through with you. Um, is there anything you wanted to uh, cover before we take questions from viewers? Just the only thing I would mention is that it looks like at this point that the people who get sick with COVID are more likely to die if they have diabetes, high blood pressure, or are overweight. And all those conditions are substantially connected to how we eat. It's the food. Uh, it's not a fair situation. I mean, if you put 20 people in a room and feed them, overfeed them with calories, some of them are going to get fatter than others. They'll all gain weight. But what people can do is to maintain their health so that if they do get the COVID virus, they're less likely to die from it and have less complications. So that would be the only yeah. thing I would add. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to start taking questions. So there is a Q&A um, section down at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, you can enter them now. Um, Stevie, were there any questions we want to answer that were entered into the chat? Yes, I know Taryn had a question about concentrated animal feeding operations. So let me see if I can go back and find it. Yeah, he asked about, um, about that pushing out wildlife and wild animals coming in contact with farm animals. Do you know anything about that, Dr. Forrester? I know, I know that's a concern, and uh, because there are natural reservoirs of these things, uh, that can affect either the concentrated animal feed operations can transmit the viruses to wild populations or vice versa. Uh, so there is, there is that connection going on. 
but the pandemics we've been suffering from the most and the ones we're most worried about are directly tied to uh, live markets and exotic animal trade and concentrated animal feed operations. Well, thank you. Um, Kim also was wondering more about why you aren't confident that a vaccine will be developed for preventing COVID-19. Uh, the only reason I say that is because uh, in my years with the medical industry, we have tried to develop vaccines for the common cold, and that's coronavirus success we do that. That does not mean we can't do that for COVID-19. It's just that past performance has not been particularly helpful. Even the influenza vaccine, which we give out every year, is not as effective as we would like it to be because of the high mutation rate in influenza. And coronavirus is a similar sort of virus. It mutates quite readily. So it's going to be a challenge. Uh, of course, the stakes are a little higher this time around. We're not talking about the common cold, obviously. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful the one will be developed, but the reason I'm a little bit not hopeful is because of our past performance. Sure. Um, I, I do have her. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kelsey. Oh, no, that's okay. You, you can go ask that question, and then I've got a, one that came up in the Q&A. Okay. Um, Susan was wondering, why is COVID-19 infecting and killing African-Americans preferentially? Well, you know, my guess would be that the African, it, it would depend on which population you're talking about. If you're talking about African-Americans in this, this country, they tend to have higher chronic disease rates. Remember, the ancestors for most of the African-Americans in this country came across in slave ships, which a lot of people died in that transit, and the people that survived were a subset of the population, so that those people tend to have higher risk for high blood pressure and diabetes and things like that. Um, but they also tend to uh, live in places like Mississippi or Alabama, who have a high African-American populations in the South, where people eat very poorly. They're, you know, I think Mississippi, they eat fried ice cream or something like that. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of, Mississippi has the highest obesity rate in the, in, in the, in the country. I think over 50% of people are obese as of the latest statistics. So once you're obese, you seem to be at a much higher rate. So to the extent there's a higher chronic conditions and chronic disease rate within a population within the United States, uh, and I think that is true for the African-American population, then they're going to have a higher death rate. That, thank you for answering that question, Dr. Forrester. I have two questions that came up in the Q&A section. Um, how can we stay safe from COVID-19 beyond adopting a plant-based diet? Avoid human contact. Simple as that? It, it's, the, the, the concept is simple. The practice is a little bit difficult since there are so many humans around. Uh, yeah. I would also mention uh, with the death rates of the African-American population uh, that there's access to medical care, of course, is another issue, uh, which is why we're doing social distancing to, quote, flatten the curve. In other words, instead of having a spike so that the hospitals are overwhelmed, it sort of spreads out the infection so that medical industry can deal with it more effectively. Uh, there's also the aspect of uh, uh, as, you know, access to good foods, which is a uh, problem mm -hmm. for people in, who are more impoverished, I think. Uh, they take yeah. less access to uh, fresh food. Yeah. Are you concerned, um, this is a question from Kim, are you concerned that COVID-19 will mutate? Yeah, concerned and hopeful. I'd love to see it mutate so it's less infectious and less dangerous. On the other hand, it can mutate and head in the other direction. Uh, most of these pandemics tend to run through populations within a one or two year period. I, it's important to realize that, you know, every, a lot of people start getting infected as the 
unfortunately, some people die, but the people that then live have immunity for a while. And once the number of people in the population that has a higher enough immunity that one infected person can no longer infect more than one person, the pandemic just stops. Yeah. So it does work its way through the population. And the crazy thing is that some of the previous infections it looks like some of the influenzas you're exposed to when you're below the age of five actually confers lifelong immunity to other types of flu that you might get. For instance, the 1918 pandemic was notable for the fact that middle-aged people died at a very higher than expected rate. And it appears that older people and were much more relatively protected because they had been exposed in the late 1800s to a pandemic that wasn't appreciated at that particular time. So each yeah. one of these pandemics comes around, we know, we learn a little bit more, um, but it, we're going to be figuring this one out for the next 12 months, 18 months. They're going to be studying this for a while. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, this question is from Lillian. How can we raise much greater awareness of the health benefits of not consuming animals? Uh, she has been a vegan for years and has found it very difficult to convince her relatives and friends that is, it is a healthier diet. Yeah, welcome to my, my world. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I work one-on-one -on -one with people all the time, and uh, talking to people about food is a little bit like talking religion and politics. There are a lot of really strongly held beliefs tied together with how people eat. And uh, there's a guy named James Prochaska who did a lot of studying of, uh, he's a psychology professor, now an emeritus psychology professor from Rhode Island University. And he studied people who change their behavior. And it looks like humans change their behavior around how they eat and some of their lifestyle for two reasons. One is when an event happens, you know, if somebody goes to the doctor and they're diagnosed with type two diabetes, hopefully their doctor is gonna say, look, it's a fat in your diet and a fat on your body, and they're not gonna send you out and count carbohydrates, which is substandard medicine at this point, because uh, Walter Kemner was curing diabetes with white rice back in the 1940s, which is low fat. So they change because of an event or the mean age of 39 and a half which is kind of interesting. You know, you get up to about age 40 and you check yourself out in the mirror and you look around and things aren't working out and people start thinking about changing. The trouble is people, there's such a toxic food and uh, information environment out there that people aren't getting the right message. Everybody's out there making their own books and coming up with, uh, you know, I mean, I worked at Kaiser for Permanente Medical Program for, 30 years and the diets that were coming out when I started were coming back again. You know, it was a grapefruit diet, you know, Atkins and, you know, over and over again. I mean, there are some effective diets out there, um, mm -hmm. but clearly eating more plants and less processed food, but you can be a fat vegan and a sick vegan. Dr. McDougall has written newsletters about both of those things. I mean, olive oil is the processed food, yeah. not a health food. Eating olive oil will mess up your arteries for another two or four hours after you eat it. Uh, but if you want to get it in its natural form, I think it's about 16 olives is the equivalent to a tablespoon of olive oil. Just like, wow. just like something like anywhere from six to 20 feet of cane sugar is the equivalent of a teaspoon of sugar. Mm. So, I mean, getting things in their natural forms, people will typically be healthier. Uh, yeah. Of course, my industry which I understand better than all the other industries I've been around, uh, is guilty of this. Because when people come in, they're overdiagnosed with blood pressure, they're put on pills instead of told about lifestyle. Uh, even my former uh, employer, the Permanent Medical Group, is still teaching counting carbohydrates as part of his diabetes education. And they have weight loss programs that are not supported at all in the literature or effective. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to throw stones here because people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones but uh, uh, it's it's difficult to talk to people because people tend to relate when people start talking to them about diet as Doug Lyle who's a psychologist with uh, 
McDougal program who has a website called Esteem Dynamics that you can get a lot of the videos he talks about. You know, he talks about how to get along without going along. Because you'll, you'll go into places and they'll test you with, they'll tempt you with foods. And a lot of it has to do with status and within groups and things that are just very complicated. So all I can tell people is just lead by example. And people will, uh, that's the way you can teach other people. Uh, yeah. Or if they develop a condition, you can refer them to places like uh, nutritionfacts.org to get the best science or the McDougal program to read a newsletter about hypertension or something like that to get some information that you can work with your physicians or treating clinicians so you're not over-treated and you actually are pursuing the right type of lifestyle. Because one of the problems I have with like the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is what Doug Lyle would call proportion of variation, which is when people come in to me and say, gee, doc, I have type 2 diabetes and I want to cure it by running. I'm out running five miles a day. I say, great, the studies have shown that that will control it but won't cure it. If you want to cure type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, you get the fat out of your diet and the fat off your body. The fat out of your diet you can get fairly quickly by just learning to cook correctly and eat the right foods, but getting the fat off your body if it's been building up for 30 or 40 years does not, as people know, happen overnight. So, but that's all about calorie density, and Jeff Novick has done a great video called Calorie Density, Eat More, Weigh Less, and Live Longer on uh, YouTube, which is available to view free. So main takeaways, lead by example, and when people have an experience to, to direct them to um, resources. Yeah, yeah the, the proper resources. Yes. I mean, and the three I follow the most are nutritionfacts.org. And for those people on the call who are not subscribed, I would do that. It's free. There's three videos a week, uh, two blogs a week. Uh, we have, I think in 2017, we had 27 volunteers that read through 37,000 articles for Dr. Greger to make the videos. I mean, there's just a lot of information out there. So it's not really fair to come down on your clinicians for not knowing this stuff. There's just so much to know. Yeah. Uh, nutritionfacts.org, PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine out of Washington, D.C. They do a wonderful job uh, not only for nutrition, but in lobbying Congress and getting laws through, as well as uh, done some fabulous work on getting animals out of research. Uh, and then, of course, there's Dr. McDougall down in Santa Rosa. The sort of crazy thing is I'm working up here for 30 years with Permanente, and John McDougall's working down in Santa Rosa, and he's running a very successful program, and I don't know about it. It's pretty mm. sad. Yeah. Mm. Um, I have an anonymous question. Um, <laughs> we are ourselves having a hard time getting answers to, to these questions, but um, this anonymous person asked, what is happening to animals at the closed plants, and is there anything we can do to stop more mass slaughtering? I hope there is. I don't know yeah. of anything, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just, <clears throat> you know, humans have for some reason treated animals as products that are there for their use and based on the discovery of oil i mean you gotta remember back when my great grandparents were farming in western oklahoma they had animals on the barnyard and you know they planted crops and they plowed fields with horses and then we discovered oil and in the late 1800s uh, someplace in pennsylvania and that source of concentrated energy has allowed us to mechanize just about everything in our daily in our lives. And what's, we're paying the price of that with climate change, of course. But without that sort of energy, concentrated animal feed operations would not exist. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's taken a drive across the country, and I've done that a couple of times, I'm amazed at how many large monoculture crops of corn and soy there are which are just mainly 80% of that goes to feed livestock. 
So we, we've lost the ability to farm in this country. Yeah. And, and so I, but unfortunately, I don't think there's anything to do for the animals that are currently in those large feed operations. I mean, when I did my three, my, my uh, six-week locum tenens in a small place in western Arkansas where my parents had retired to, I was one of four or five doctors in town. There were large chicken f houses on the outskirts of that town. And yeah. they would just go in every six weeks and literally just clean them out. You know, people would go in, they'd grab three chickens in each hand and just bring them out. And, of course, those chickens are genetically modified, so they couldn't possibly live on their own. They're bred to grow fast and with a lot more meat, and they have trouble standing up. And, they, you know, it's just, it's horrific, uh, really. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think, I think other than if we could get people to stop eating meat, of course, then those things would go away. If we could get the government yeah. to stop subsidizing those meats, I saw once that if the government removed all subsidies away from the beef industry and required them to clean up their manure from their concentrated feeding operations for the fattening operations for cattle, we'd be paying $90 a pound for beef. I mean, if you started paying $90 a pound for beef, there's going to be a lot less beef consumption in the country. Definitely. Definitely. So, so it's, it's multifaceted, but I think you just have to, I mean, in my industry, I just worked on one person at a time because I was in an exam room. People were coming to me with problems. I was giving them advice. Uh, I didn't get a lot of these memos till after I left Permanente. I started doing a little of it before I left, fortunately. Um, and of course, we've learned since 2008. I mean, a lot of the science we now know about health, like the fats and diabetes and stuff like that, that we now know why Walter Kempner was curing diabetes with white rice in the 40s. It's just been since the 90s, 1990s and 2000s. Yeah. Well, encouraging one person at a time we're, well, to make a change is helpful. We're seeing, we're seeing you know, plant-based diets increase. I think that the number of vegans hasn't really gone up that much over time. But the number of people who are eating more plants, in other words, are having a meat-free Monday or, you know, they're, liber they're, they're, they're taking meats out of their food. I mean, there's, helpful, there's hopeful signs like the dairy industries, you know, around the country are going out of business. Yeah. You know, the U.S. citizens have gotten the memo somehow that they're not baby cows, you know. I mm -hmm. wish nutritionists would get that memo because, you know, they, they seem to think that before the age of two, kids shouldn't drink milk. And then at age two, they suddenly turn into baby cows or something and they can, it's, milk's okay, you know. Um, we went through that with our grandkids, you know, where their pediatricians are telling them one thing and I'm telling them something else. Yeah. So. Is um, there, this question's from Jennifer and she asked, is there a learning resource you think is best for people who want to learn how to eat a vegan diet and supplement, especially B12 and omegas? Uh, oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think uh, there, people do it a lot of different ways. It's like how people quit smoking. You know, some people just cold turkey. Other people just take their favorite recipes and start making them more plant-based. And there's plenty of resources on the web. I know my wife who tends to like to change the recipes around a lot. She'll look at what she's got in the pantry and the, and the refrigerator and then just Google it, say vegan diet with these ingredients and she gets these recipes. Uh, PCRM has a, uh, thir thir has a food for life 21 day kickstart program, which you can get into at any time. And over 21 days, it tells you how to do this. Uh, Doug Lyle's a big fan of controlling your environment. Uh, you know, I have trouble with that because I like to eat things that I probably shouldn't eat. My <laughs> wife, my wife actually is very disciplined. So she's one of those people that can eat half a cookie. So she'll make 12 cookies and eat half a cookie. <laughs> and then there's 11 and a half cookies lying around. And uh, that's not conducive to my environmental trying to lose another five pounds off my waist. I wouldn't imagine. Waste not, want not, right? That's what my mother of always said. So <laughs> yeah. if you control your environment, I mean, if we take people and put them in rooms and feed them nothing but vegetables, then people walk out. 
Yeah. Um, so I think part of it is, you know, by trying to change people, just you will have more effect on people you know, your immediate family and friends, than you will over people you don't know. Um, and these changes take time. People adjust. That's how they learn. They learn how to do something, and then they fall back off the wagon, and they get back on the wagon, and then they get back off the wagon. And that's the way we learn. Uh, mm -hmm. so I would just encourage people to continue talking about it and letting people, uh, turning people onto resources like PCRM or uh, the McDougal program um, or even uh, nutritionfacts.org is now putting recipes out. Dr. Greger has his daily dozen, and you can just cover the daily dozen. And then if, if you do the daily dozen, you're probably not going to have a lot of room for other types of food. <laughs> I mean, three servings yeah. of a day is, or four, whatever it is on the, I'd have to look again. I just do this stuff automatically now. Um, learning to cook without oil. Who would have thought, right? But if you look at most recipes in our old cookbooks, it's like throw three tablespoons of olive oil in the pan. Why three tablespoons? Why not two? Why not one, right? Why not yeah. water saute or use mm -hmm. broth? I mean, you just have to pay attention. You'll burn something. for. You just have to learn how to do that stuff. For those people that want to go to the extreme, the standing joke is that uh, the McDougal program down in Santa Rosa is prison light. And for those people that know True North, which is a mile away, mile and a half away, which is Alan Goldhammer's shop, where they do water, medically supervised water fasting. So there's 50 or 60 people living at True North. It's sort of like an apartment building, but it's really not. There are suites and people are living there. And they're rounded on three times a day, but they are whole food, plant-based. They're not only whole food, plant-based, but they're SOS free. There is no salt, oil, or sugar in any of their food. So that's the other, you know, uh, the other extreme is uh, SOS, whole foods, whole plant foods. Yeah. Um, Starla asked and stated, as you said, touching lives one person at a time and as a doctor, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with patients and giving them advice to switch to a plant-based diet for their own health benefit, what is the most common response and do they adhere to that, um, to feel or get better, or do they resist? I think the most common response is, where do I get my protein? <laughs> People are always concerned about that. It's been uh, hammered into them so much. And then, of course, everybody's level of education about this is different, so you sort of have to tailor it when they ask you. Um, I would just tell them what, as a physician, I would just try not to over-treat them, which a lot of doctors do, especially for blood pressure uh, and diabetes, and say, you know, you've got two choices here. There's plan A or plan B, and I would always like to have the conversation with the patient and their spouse if the spouse was the one that did most of the cooking. Because some of my patients wouldn't even know where the kitchen was. Yeah. <laughs> Boiling water would be a challenge. Right. Uh, uh -huh. So you, once you have the concept, then you have to learn how to shop, and which means you have to learn how to read labels. And of course, unless you eat foods with no labels, then you don't have to read the labels. Jeff Novick has a good series on reading labels, which I think you can get through Amazon. His uh, calorie density lecture on YouTube is free, which gives you the basic organizing principle around how you want to lose weight. If you want to know everything that we know at this particular point or knew up until last year, you can get How Not to Diet, which is Dr. Greger's book. It's a little pricey. It's 500 pages long. The reason it's only 500 pages long is we got him to cut out the 400 pages of references and put them online. So there's like 5,000 rest. Re references, every question you want to know about how to lose weight is in there. Intermittent fasting, uh, you know, calorie density. So he came up, in addition to the daily dozen, he came up with the 21 tweaks, which are little tweaks. You know, once you get the concepts of calorie density and you've done about as good as you can, if you need to tweak things a little bit, you know, maybe you throw a little bit of balsamic vinegar, you know, a couple tablespoons a day onto your food. 
that's been proven to help people lose a little weight. Is, should it be a balsamic vinegar diet? Absolutely not. It should be calorie density, less energy dense foods, which tend to be vegetables, fruits, starches, potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, and the grains, and beans. Those are the lowest calorie injury energy dense foods. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering those questions. Just to be aware of time, it is 2.57, um, so we're almost at about an hour. I don't have any more questions in the Q&A. Stevie, do you have any more questions in the chat? Yeah, it looks like we have one question from Barbara. She wanted to know if Dr. Forrester still consults with individuals regarding diet, health, and lifestyle, and if so, how to get in touch with you and where. So the answer to that is I almost surrendered my license this month, last month, but John McDougall talked me into signing up for two more years and I was crazy enough to do it. So I'm still licensed in the state of California so I can give medical advice. But I find it's better since I don't have an office and work within a medical organization like Permanente, which I did for a number of years, is if people just get the right information and if they send me an email, I'd be glad to send, you know, send them information. Uh, I, I'm a golfer. So, you know, in the next month or two, I'll be back out on the golf course. And I tend to get hooked up with other people who I don't know because I go out at weird times. And they tend to be older people because I don't go out on weekends. And, you know, uh, after about half the round is over, they find out what I did and they start giving me their medical history and, and they start asking me about medications and I say, well, do you want to be off of them? And they say, yeah, I, I, this is my diagnosis. So I've got all these emails for all these chronic conditions and I just have them write their name down and their email address and I send it to them. So it, they're the best resources that I've found for individuals to understand like what diabetes is all about and how to lose weight and blood pressure. And a lot of those are nutrition facts videos. One of the problems with nutritionfacts.org is there's 1,800 videos. So if you search for diabetes, you're gonna get maybe 80 or 90 videos, but there's like two or three that I really like to actually give you the basic fat on your body, fat in your diet sort of understanding. Once you have the concepts, then it's a question of working with your clinician. That's especially important if they've already treated you with blood pressure or diabetic medicines. Because in the McDougall program where I worked, you know, when I first got there, uh, John McDougall gave me a letter and told me what to do. And I had sat down and he wanted to sit down with me. So I said, John, are you really sure you want me to take them off blood pressure medicine and diabetic medicine on the first day of the program? Which is just totally foreign to me at that point. And he said, just trust me, Don, do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. It's a very well-run program. By the end of the week, people were better off than they came in off their medicine. It was just bizarre. It was like detox medicine. So it's important if people are on medications that they work with their clinicians. So I'm willing to give, provide information to people. I'm even willing to set up phone conversations and talk to people about it. But, but part of it is that if they get educated and they go in and talk to their physician, my hope, my fantasy is that the doctors will start figuring this stuff out. And then if we can change a doctor, then every time that doctor talks to one of their patients, then they will make progress as well. So my preference is that people just send me an email and they can, my email is uh, fairly simple to remember. It's just D-O-N, my first name, Don Forrester, F-O-R-R, -R, the first four letters of my last name. So it's D-O-N-F-O-R-R -R at gmail.com. And if you just send me an, an email and say, you know, you're part of the Animal Place webinar and just wanted some information on this chronic condition, I'll send you my email. And if I don't have one on it, I'll take, take the challenge and create one because if, it, if you're then that's great. That's wonderful and really generous of you to be willing to share your email. Um, Stevie, did you have any other questions? No, I think that is it, and we're right on time. Well, if anybody does want to send, if they have, if a question comes up later and they want to send me an email, I'm not a problem with that too, because 
that's the way people learn. You know, they, they get some information they need and then down the line. I mean, we're still learning how to cook. We've been doing this for now. Let's see, I was 58. I'm now 72. So we've been vegan for 14 years. My wife's a professor of philosophy at Sac City College in her last semester. And she is very heavily into animal rights and feminism. And uh, I'd say she gets about 25% of her classes to go vegan every semester. Uh, so, but that's how people learn. You know, they get exposed to new information and they sit on it for a while. They try some stuff out. They have questions. They just need resources they can go to. And, and you want to get reliable resources. And everybody's a little different. Everybody learns a little differently. So I'm willing to share what I know and what has worked for me personally and what I think are the most important. But it'll be up to the individuals to sort of make it work for them, their family, you know, uh, their friends, you know, and their social yeah. environment. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time, um, donating your time to talk with us today um, and also sharing your email and information that you can provide. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, you, we'll let you. You guys do great work up at Animal Place and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, when you guys are open for business again so we can go up and take the grandkids up to see the animals again. We're looking forward to it too. We, we can't wait to have you all. All right, we'll let you get Get back to your day. Thank you so much, Dr. Forrester.